So, <laughs> my first question to you is a bit about the focus that has been chosen uh, in, in your work on anti-corruption issues, also in light of the specific context of Bhutan. So first, what was your mandate? We have heard this morning it's important to look at the mandate, but also what have been the most pressing problems you were, and what did you then actually address? What was your strategic focus? Okay. Uh, thank you very much uh, to the organizers for inviting me over and uh, giving me this opportunity to share my humble experience. And uh, of course, every country has its own experience and the cultural context and political context is so different. So what we have experienced in Bhutan may not necessarily, but I necessarily apply in your context. Uh, but I believe that uh, challenges that face the anti-corruption agencies are generally common, uh, generally common. Uh, the issues that we discussed in the morning about independence, political, uh, the, the human resources, these are actually issues that is discussed all over. And um, Bhutan, I do not know whether uh, uh, many of you know where Bhutan is. I remember when I was studying in the UK, my letter home went to, uh, not Bukina, Benin. <laughs> uh, even the postmaster did not know where Bhutan was uh, located. But I believe you must have heard a lot about gross national happiness. Happiness, that Bhutan is one of the happiest countries, and Denmark, of course, we couldn't meet uh, Denmark. Uh, we are trying to meet, beat uh, Denmark. So a very small country, small kingdom, um, nestled in the Himalayas, and sandwiched between the two most populous countries in the world, uh, India and uh, India, east, west, and uh, south, and uh, the autonomous region of Tibet, uh, that is a China, uh, China mainland uh, uh, in the north. and. Uh, Highly, we are a deeply spiritual and uh, uh, culturally steeped uh, uh, society. Very small society. We are just about 700,000 people. Uh, so you can imagine some of you who have millions, and uh, in India, of course, billion, and Pakistan, maybe a few millions. Uh, very small country, half a million. So by that token, things are perhaps easier. But sometimes being small also has its own challenges. Um, so this is the context. And then, of course, uh, until uh, 2008, uh, we were an absolute monarchy. A form of government was absolute monarchy until 2008. And since 2008, the new form of government is the, the uh, democratic constitutional monarchy, so that's a parliamentary democracy. So now, like any other country, we have politics and political parties, and uh, which perhaps is complicating matters. Um, yes. Uh, so I've also joined politics now. <laughs> I worked in CSO after my retirement uh, from the ACC, uh, the Anti-Corruption Commission, then worked two, for two years in the civil society organization with the grassroots, and now I've joined politics, and hopefully with the uh, anti-corruption agenda, and uh, trying to bring the political parties to the fore and uh, having the leadership uh, commit. And you mentioned about what were the pressing issues. Those days when we started, uh, I'd also like to share 10 commandments because certain things, I think people who are working in the Anti-Corruption Commission, we can also be very arrogant. Uh, we can also be very egoistic. I think in that organization, one has to leave aside your ego. Uh, there are 10 commandments. Of course, I don't have the time to really go through all the 10 commandments. But some things that I remember is that this institution must know what it has to do. It must be very clear about its purpose. The clarity of purpose has to be there. It has to be a credible and incorruptible organization and a fearless organization. Um, and then plus, the leadership has to lead by example. The leadership has to set the tone. And we cannot have corruption in the organization and we cannot have uh, politics in the organization. Uh, it can really fracture the organization. The other thing is, the anti-corruption, from my experience again, uh, the anti-corruption commission should not think that it is uh, responsibly trusted, uh, entrusted upon us and we are the power unto ourselves. I think we must all recognize that anti-corruption institutions or agencies or commissions, they are actually more of a facilitating, uh, more of a facilitator. But again, it depends on one's own context. But in our case, what we have carefully tried to design is more as a facilitator so that ownership is there. So that's why our ultimate vision was to be redundant and not to really propagate ourselves. So what were the pressing, uh, pressing issues? Uh, there are 10 commandments. I have written all this, so I will also share the soft copy, uh, maybe through the website. So the press, uh, pressing issues that you mentioned. There are two, two or three pressing issues that we had to. First of all, some people often ask me that am I a lawyer? 
I'm not a lawyer. I'm neither am I an anti-corruption expert, by the way. I'm a, by profession, by an, uh, an engineer, but a lost engineer, uh, but have moved from one profession to another profession. The only qualification I have is my passion and my commitment. And that is the only qualification. And I believe that these are very important qualifications. The rest, uh, your technical skills will come from STC. Uh, <laughs> uh, then somebody also in the morning in the presentation, we also heard that uh, anti-corruption, oh, uh, we, when we had our group discussion uh, where we, the Asian countries were there, Laos, Cambodia, Vietnam, and somebody mentioned that oh, anti-corruption people do not know what they are supposed to do. They don't have skills. But here in Bhutan, what we had to do was simultaneously, the hun there was no honeymoon period because it was a new establishment, that, uh, a new institution that we were establishing. So we had to, we could not say that I don't have the capacity right now, let me gather the capacity and then start doing something after five years. No, so if one is committed, I think you can do so many things. You, don't have the, you may not have the capacity, but definitely you can draw on your, re the, your regional friends through your development partners. And this is what we have done. And even we don't, and then meanwhile, you also build your capacity. We visit a few countries. But anyway, some of the pressing issues were that um, people do not know what corruption, did not understand what corruption was. Even like when we started uh, problems in the marriages, black magic allegations came to us. So you can imagine no, the, the, how people understood uh, that corruption thing was not there, the understanding of corruption. The other thing is that the elite, the powerful lot, did not accept that there was corruption. Generally, okay, corruption, because sometimes you're very shy to talk about gender inequality, shy to talk about poverty, shy to talk about human rights violations, shy to talk about corruption being there. So the, the deni denial, the strong denial that there is no pervasive corruption. Yes, there are corruption, but here and there. So that denial, and these are very, I think, actually big forces that you have to overcome. So not knowing what corruption is all about, so when you do not know what corruption, then uh, forms of corruption, causes, prevalence, so that ignorance was there. And then plus being a small society, as mentioning that society, uh, small can be beautiful, but sometimes society, society, being small also has its inherent challenges. Being small, everybody knowing everybody, almost being related to each other through matrimony or bl through blood, that sometimes you're also fearful to raise a voice. So it's not only in Bhutan or Asian society, but even I heard, I learned that my first, one of my first trips was to Zurich. The, 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 the prosecution office, uh, the prosecutor was even refusing to talk to us, no? because he, he said that uh, even in, uh, in Switzerland, people somehow hesitated to report or disclose information. So it's not only a characteristic of the Asian countries, we often say that, oh, the Asian, the Africans, and thing, but even in uh, developed countries like Europe, there are such problems. So these were some of the pressing issues that uh, we were facing. Sorry, this was a very long response, but I had to give some background also. No, that's fine, thanks. <laughs> but then maybe uh, just to continue, first I wanted to know a bit what were the corruption issues that you have been addressing, but maybe because you were already talking about the challenges, um, when you say one issue, big challenge is that people do not understand what corruption is, they don't talk about it. So what did you do to address this? Mm -hmm. The first thing that we did was we organized a big stakeholders meeting, about 300 people. That was uh, immediately after, uh, after establishment, one week after establishment, or one month after establishment, because we also had to have the laws. Because our Anti-Corruption Commission of Bhutan, we had three mandates, uh, uh, prevention, advocacy, and as well as investigation. Uh, we don't have the, the prosecutorial authority, but in certain cases where the prosecutor general fails to prosecute, then we can come in. So semi-prosecutorial responsibility we can have, but full authority lies with. So we have these primary mandates like uh, any other, most of the anti-corruption agencies. Uh, so what we did was uh, basically people must understand and then also trying to understand people's perception. So we had this big uh, conference, about 3,000 and uh, stakeholders from everywhere, not only just the government, but private sector, CSOs, youth, teachers, students. And um, we don't have the expertise, but we actually uh, brought in uh, the uh, Singapore, the anti-corruption uh, director, retired director, and he facilitated the whole process. And UNDP, UNDP and STC have been very, of course, that is coming to the donor thing, but they've been very supportive. Because I think donors have to uh, also come in time. 
So because we had, just as we were establishing, we had these uh, inputs from the donors. So we were able to bring in experts from outside. And so we had this big uh, stakeholders meeting and then wanted to develop a national anti-corruption strategy so that at least there is some sort of a understanding about what corruption is all about, general understanding. And then in understanding, also carrying out a survey about uh, how people perceived, what were the forms of uh, corruption that was prevalent, and what were the causes, and then uh, what could we do about what could be the possible interventions. The laws had to be drafted. A draft was already there, but we had to finalize that law, uh, because without the laws, we cannot also have the authority to investigate. Uh, so these were important. So the, yeah, simultaneously, many things were happening as I was also growing, as my team was also growing. By the way, I also forgot to mention about our appointments. Our appointment is done by a group of five people. And these are, we also heard about politicization of uh, recruitment or appointment of these high position, uh, um, uh, high post um, appointments. So we were appointed by a group of five people as per the constitution. There's a prime minister, the opposition leader, the speaker of the house, the the chair of the Senate, the upper house, we call that National Assembly, uh, National Council. And then we have the, uh, the chief justice the group of five people who appoint uh, the, the three uh, commission, uh, commissioners in the Anti-Corruption uh, Commission, and for that matter, all the other constitutional post holders, we have four constitutional officers. Yeah, big, big work, but summed up in one minute. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you were saying that you also did uh, perception surveys and discussions, so what were the most pressing issues for people yes. or mm -hmm. Corruption issues yes, that came yes, out yes. and that you then also tried to address? Yeah. yeah. Uh, in 1999, in fact, before I established MEN, by the way, we were established in 2006, that was also preparing for the parliament democracy. Two institutions were established the Anti Corruption Commission and then the Election Commission. So in 2019, uh, in 1999, uh, a very limited interview was conducted by uh, the Center for Bhutan Studies, is a think tank. So there, the, the major form of corruption was nepotism and favoritism, especially in personnel matters. Abuse of authority, so it's about misusing your position. Abuse of uh, natural, uh, your resources. So this was also reconfirmed in 2007. We conducted a perception uh, survey, which is also supported by the, our development partners. So, and then this was outsourced to another agency, the National Statistical Bureau. Mm -hmm. So again, this is, all these examples I'm trying to illustrate that it was not about just our team alone, but it was about working together with other teams. So here the, the, uh, the survey was conducted by the National, uh, uh, National Statistical Bureau. So the outcome of that result, 2007 perception survey, corruption perception survey, the biggest from 50%, I think it was about 50% of the respondents said, and it was a very big survey involving about six, over 6,000 people, respondents, uh, rural, urban, and different profession, nepotism and favoritism. Mm -hmm. And I think it is not surprising in a small society because, again, culture. Somebody was talking in the morning about culture uh, because it was only natural to expect your kid and your uh, relatives in higher positions to help you with appointments or scholarship or transfers. And it was only natural. And if you did not do that, you were failing in your duty. And gift giving, like in, uh, in, our, in our society, gift giving was very natural. So where do you draw the line? What is culture and what is corruption? So these were, uh, these were some of the, the findings. You know? So nepotism, favoritism, the biggest uh, form of uh, corruption that was uh, found uh, prevalent in the country by the people. And uh, abuse of authority, misuse of funds, collusion between the contractors and then the, civil, the bureaucrats. So these were the, the major forms of uh, corruption that was uh, found prevalent or in, in terms of people's perception. What was your strategy to address this? I mean, one hand, you can do investigations or monitoring, mm, mm. but you also then do this mindset and yes. culture change. So what mm, were mm. your strategies to address or to address this yeah, actually yeah. concretely? One, one of our primary strategies has been to main, mainstream uh, anti-corruption measure. Uh, initially, we were working one-to-one -one and with willing partners, whether it was about systems, Looking at, um, so it was you know, with working with willing partners, whether they were schools or whether they were uh, ministries or whether they were private sector one to one. But we felt that perhaps this was not going to take us far. So then what we did was uh, really means working with the Civil Service Commission about code of conduct. Like any other bureaucracy, we have this code of conduct, ethics, code of conduct, and ethics. 
Even in US, they have this ethics department, and I'm sure in the, in the Swiss government, you have this ethics. But then, these instruments are as good as their, how people understand, understand these instruments and then how they're implemented. Uh, so these were there. Conflict of interest was never heard of. Uh, so it was, again, a new, new element, conflict of interest. So Code of Conduct, we worked together with the, um, uh, the, Civil Service Commission, the Civil Service Commission, which is a constitutional body, the oversight body for the bureaucracy, the government machinery. So we worked on making Code of Conduct and uh, the, the Code of Ethics and Conduct more realistic and train people whether, and then see whether they understood or not. And then in terms of compliance, having a structure to ensure the compliance. So this is how, what we worked at. And how did you do that? Because this is always, this is the challenge. Yes, you know, the yes, compliance yes. At the end. So like how for, did you ensure Yeah, compliance? for example, if I can uh, start with uh, the Anti-Corruption Commission. In Anti-Corruption Commission, what we said that we've always tried all these instruments within ourselves first. In the Anti-Corruption Commission, what we did was that uh, the Code of Conduct and Ethics, it was developed together. So, so that it, is, it doesn't appear to be imposed by the commission of three members, but it is an, you, developed together, you develop it together, and then plus the ownership lies. Only in having that ownership, I think that, uh, that um, uh, willingness to abide by is there. So train again. You know? and, but again, we don't have this expertise, so we invited expertise. Uh, our governance uh, unit in the regional office in UNDP in Bangkok, and then we had somebody from, I don't know, somewhere, uh, to uh, talk about conflict of interest. And then we designed this in the Anti-Corruption Commission, trained our people, and then also have put in place a structure, a committee, who will actually monitor the compliance. So compliance was not very formal also, but peer-to-peer, -peer, how would you do that? And then plus, um, if somebody has a complaint, then where would you go? So all these implemented structures were also there. So after this experience, then we shared with the, uh, the Public Service Commission, and we also had this uh, online uh, integrity training. Uh, so this was the first time uh, that we, so making it uh, compulsory, and not that people working on, people taking this course uh, whenever they're free, and then also monitoring how well they're doing it. Um, so at least making a code of conduct and ethics not just a subscription or not a prescription of uh, uh, how you should behave, but even understanding and uh, doing that. The other thing was, um, having uh, anti-corruption measures in the uh, development planning process. So like in uh, Malaysia, if somebody is there from Malaysia, you have these uh, national uh, key indicators, national key indica indicators. And one of the national key indicators we started from 2013 is this cor reduced corruption, corruption reduced. So, um, so then with that, so all the sectors, they also mainstream uh, anti-corruption uh, measure. And I think that is more successful when you look at, uh, um, look at the system from the systems part and then who matters. The cabinet is very important. One uh, commandment is that uh, the anti-corruption cannot antagonize the government because things have to happen there. So we have to work together and we must uh, totally capitalize uh, uh, on the relationship that we build uh, with the, the government uh, and of course institutions like the judiciary and then the parliament. Uh, the other um, useful... Maybe just uh, to add to this, sorry yeah. for interrupting. Yeah. You were mentioning different institutions and yeah. actors, yeah. so to, to, to spell it out concretely, with whom did you interact and collaborate and yeah. how yeah. did this yeah. happen? If I can... Um, um, one of our successful stories is uh, with the parliament. Our collaboration with the parliament. The law requires us to submit an annual report to the parliament to the assembly as well as to the, the Senate and the Congress, if I might put in something that is more understandable. Uh, we call it National Assembly and the National Council. So it's two objectives, fulfilling two objectives. One objective, first objective is fixing accountability, whether the Anti-Corruption Commission is doing its work or not, fulfilling its mandate. The other objective is also plans that we have prepared, whether the agencies are also implementing or not. So it's also some sort of a monitoring, uh, monitoring uh, tool. So this was the annual report of the Anti-Corruption Commission was a wonderful uh, platform for dialogue with the parliamentarians. And um, many of the discussions, particularly in the upper house, in the upper house, fast, going fast, is it? Okay. Because I always, normally in conferences, I always get complaints from the uh, interpreter that I'm going too fast. So I have so much to share, you know? And this is something that Anti-Corruption Commission must realize that they have to be patient. Huh? So I have to be also patient, sorry. 
and be relaxed. <laughs> no, please, go on. <laughs> So this was a wonderful platform. The Anti-Corruption Commission's uh, annual report provided a platform for dialogue with the parliamentarians. And um, so a lot of discussions and resolutions and policy instruction also came from the annual report. So it was a matter of pride. And not only that, um, the, we could also intervene in the anti-corruption measures of the parliament. So we had uh, these, uh, the corruption risk management uh, conducted in the National Council and also in the National Assembly. They, because then they were willing because they really, they had to set the tone and they had to be the example for the others. So very successful. And judiciary, for example, judiciary is another one because normally judiciary is a power unto itself. It's untouchable. Um, so judiciary also welcomed the idea about conducting, uh, what is that, judicial integrity assessment. So where it has reached, I do not know, because by the time uh, this was introduced, I, so at least you are happy that you could actually make interventions into these very important institutions. Um, yeah, so many things crowded in my head. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I think when you, you mention now the, the different work you did, you certainly, and you mentioned at the beginning that elites actually yes. denied that yes. there is corruption yes. so yes. Yes. how did you did you were you faced also with interference how did you okay. deal with that political pressure yeah. or yeah. other interest pressures yeah yeah or oh, the other challenge was that oh uh, mm, of a denial and then the elite are untouchable the powerful and the lot are untouchable but one success story is that untouchables became touchables so even you may not have succeeded but the very thought that you have investigated against them is so powerful. And it really, uh, it really demolishes that, uh, what you say, that I'm powerful and I'm, you know. Uh, so um, in terms of pressure, in a small society, uh, again, it's good that you know each other. And when people know that you are a team of no nonsense, uh, no nonsense, and when you know that these people are not going to budge, and uh, things become easy. And more importantly, when you, are, when you are not worried about consequences, we, we're talking about the risks in Honduras, risks everywhere. People have given up their lives. You know? Journalists have died. Anti-corruption activists have died. So many people have died all over the world for all these causes. And if you, of course, Bhutan has not reached that uh, level, by the way. Uh, otherwise, I would have also died. <laughs> but... Um, in Bhutan, it's a subtle pressure, no? So they may not be able to do anything to you, but they will see that your nephew doesn't get the contract or your niece is transferred to some remote place. So it's, it's very subtle again. Um, so pressure, no, not at all. Uh, but maybe pressure can manifest in a different way in the sense that, okay, fine. Um, you are collaborating with an agency, but the, the agency, somebody has been hurt. So in terms of implementation of the program, perhaps the delay is there. You know? So this sort of thing, very subtle. You know? So in our case, um, what did I want to say now? So in terms of pressure, no. I must uh, proudly say that there has been no pressure because I think people have realized that this is a team of uh, no nonsense and people, because at the end of the day, what will happen? They'll put you behind bars, they'll kill you. In any case, one day we'll die and you lose your job, it's fine. So once you have that sort of attitude, it becomes very easy. And then also when you have this attitude about you're working towards your own redundancy, then you're not thinking about building an empire. Again, it becomes a, there's, there's a lot of freedom in what you want to do. And uh, so uh, we have been very, very fortunate. We have been very fortunate. There has been no pressure from anybody. In fact, we have been in Bhutan, our anti-corruption champions, you know who they are. They're not CSOs. They're not media people but they are our kings. The fourth king and then his son, the present king, they are our champions. In fact, the fourth king, the fourth king, he has, when before the constitution, the anti-corruption commission was established through a royal decree. Uh, he has been very concerned about uh, corruption and he's been giving this command that corruption should not take root. But I think corruption has taken root in Bhutan also, but perhaps the magnitude is less. So there are anti-corruption champions. So in your part of the world, in some, most part of the world, Anti-corruption champions have to be sought in the activists, in the CSOs and the media, but no. 
And in our media, in fact, you will not believe that Anti-Corruption Commission has been very progressive in the sense that we sought partnership in the media, the media houses fraternity, signed MOUs with them. We sought partnership in the CSOs. We signed about uh, 10 MOUs with the CSOs. So sometimes uh, you don't, can't think about that Bhutan has about 53 CSOs. So no political pressure at all. So that's why I com completed my term, because we are also protected by the constitution. First of all, the, uh, the, election, the appointment is also perhaps more rigorous. And uh, then even your removal, you can only be removed through impeachment by two thirds of the parliament. So actually the, an enabling environment was very important and helpful, but you also had to be strong and pervasive to, to stay on your course. That was helpful, yes. and I think also the, the, the linkage building, mm -hmm. you, you engaged with different mm -hmm. institutions yes, and yes, actors yes, yes. that helped yes, you also so to overcome yeah, and to be yeah. also effective. You also yes, yes. achieved some key yes, results, yes, as yes, you described, yes, in yes. mainstreaming yes, uh, yes, anti-corruption yes, measures yes, yes. and addressing also grand corruption mm, cases, mm, as mm, I understood. Mm, mm. Yes. In fact, um, uh, if I might... Uh, uh, one thing that I also, again, one of the commandments, if we continue to use this word corruption, 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 after some time people get really repulsive, because this is a very, very repulsive term, corruption. Can we be positive? Yet you will be fighting corruption. Can we use integrity? Can we use good governance? Can we use empowerment of people? Can we use system correction and re-engineering? So sometimes these are more effective and then make people more uh, uh, acceptable. And um, what did you say? What was your question? Sorry. No, no, it's okay. <laughs> I just summarized a bit what you were saying. Yeah. <laughs>